Hello everyone, my name is Wendy Cantrell. I am a nurse practitioner in Birmingham, Alabama, and I'm in private practice at Village Dermatology. And I wanted to share with you one of the most interesting cases that I really have ever had. I've been practicing for almost 23 years now, and this was a first. Um, so when we heard that the theme this year was gonna be Stranger Things. This was one of the case studies that came to mind. So I wanna share with you um, this patient. Um, he came in, um, he's tw he was 24 years old, a Caucasian male. And of course, the rash was not present during the visit. And you know, all of us kind of roll our eyes and um, wonder what the rash looks like and if it does come and go as they say, um, but um, the rash wasn't present. He said that it comes and goes about two or three times a month. And what's interesting is he says that it starts on his palms and soles and spreads up his extremities um, over his body. Um, it does come up as exquisitely tender red bumps. Um, and he, as he's telling me this, I notice he's getting more and more uncomfortable. Um, it's like he's embarrassed about this rash. And so I was in, a little bit intrigued. Um, he said that it intensely itched and that he had significant joint pain and fatigue for two to three days. In fact, he said that the intense um, symptoms last about 30 to 40 minutes. And he actually had to go to bed to, to, to lie down, to take a nap um, in order for him to even recover. Um, he does um, say that he didn't really know what to take, um, but sometimes he thinks that Benadryl helps. Um, and he, but he wonders, he said, you know, I wonder if it just helps me sleep because I'm in so much pain and, and every time I move my joints hurt. So he's not sure if the Benadryl really helps or it just helps symptomatically, helps put him to sleep for a little while. So here's the kicker. It only happens after he has a bowel movement. And he said, you know, sometimes, especially on the more severe um, times that he has had this rash, he said sometimes his, um, his, his bowel movement is loose, but other times it's completely normal. And he has no really symptoms that warn him um, that, that this reaction is coming. So now I'm intrigued, right? Um, he's a healthy six foot male, normal weight, 160 pounds. He says he's not on any medication, um, medications on a daily basis. Um, he did tell me he sometimes takes Benadryl when it happens. Um, he denies any surgeries. He denies drinking alcohol. Um, he says he doesn't smoke or vape. He says he doesn't have any personal history of bowel issues, like no irritable bowel, no inflammatory bowel, um, no colon cancer. So again, I'm super intrigued by this and, and, and really, to be honest with you, very confused at what I'm going to do. So I talked to him further and, you know, nurse practitioners and physician assistants, one of the things that we hear quite frequently is that often we take the time to talk to our patients to understand exactly how their condition is impacting them. Um, this patient gets almost teary at how one embarrassed he is. He has no idea who's he gonna, he said, who am I gonna talk to about this? Um, he says that at work, he can't go into his boss and say, hey, when I have a poop, I might have this rash and I can't come to work for three days. Um, he doesn't feel like he can disclose that um, to, to his employer. Um, so he's had multiple sick days because sometimes it's two and three days that he just cannot physically get out of bed because he is hurting. Um, he feels like he is not progressing in the company and feels like that he is kind of messing up his chance um, to, to climb the ladder. And then also, so it's like a social impact. You know, we can't minimize the fact that he's embarrassed. He doesn't want to go out with friends because what if he has to go while he is while he is there? There's no progenal kind of effect. He doesn't know that it's coming. Um, it just appears to be random. 
he's not really willing to date seriously. Um, so he's kind of withdrawn and a little bit depressed because it's just so random. He doesn't really know what to do. Um, so again, all these things are circling in my mind. Um, what do you, what's the diagnosis? Um, I have no idea. A couple of things that popped into my mind, scabies. He does describe the itching as intense um, with, with erythematous papules. Um, but the downside is, is that it comes and goes. So that doesn't fit. That negative doesn't fit. Again, I have no idea. Then I think, okay, well, maybe hand, foot, mouth, because it does have painful erythematous papules um, on his palms and soles that start. Um, but again, negatively, that kind of goes against that is it does come and go. You know, and then some sort of arthritis, some sort of autoimmune something, rheumatoid arthritis, you know, pops into mind, but it, because it is painful joints. But for him, it resolves relatively quickly with no permanent swelling of the joint. Um, so it just nothing quite fits. So, you know, it's one of those one of those cases where you're going, I have no idea what I'm going to do with this patient. And then I thought um, I have a friend. Um, and this is Christine, and she is a rectal cancer survivor. At, at, um, at 40, she was diagnosed, so almost 10 years ago, she was diagnosed with um, um, stage two um, rectal cancer. Um, and thank heavens, they were able, she was really concerned. She didn't want a colonoscopy, uh, she didn't want a colostomy bag, um, and they worked hard to help her with that. But in treating it and not going the colostomy route, um, she was at risk um, because they, they formed a little pouch um, and she has had to train her body so that she can um, have bowel movements regularly. Um, and one of the things that she was at risk for was um, something called bowel bypass syndrome. Um, and another name, and so I, I, I I was like, okay, so let me look into this. Let me see if this can happen if he hasn't had a, a bowel diagnosis or bowel surgery. Um, and so this is kind of where I went with the diagnosis. So bowel bypass um, syndrome is also known as bowel associated dermatosis arthritis syndrome. I love the acronym badass, right? Um, so um, it, I'm like, okay, maybe I'm getting somewhere. It can also be um, known as blind loop syndrome. It actually, most in the literature, you're going to see now bad, um, the, the badass um, um, acronym here um, with bowel associated dermatosis arthritis syndrome. Um, but so that's kind of where I went with this. And um, this is a re relapsing course. It's associated with arthritis and rash. Um, sometimes patients say that a fever um, will accompany um, the, the, the outbreak. And it was first described in 1971. Um, and that it, it was described specifically after we started doing the full gastric bypass um, for obesity and weight loss. Um, and it was, it was identified that up to 20% of patients with bowel shortening surgeries um, for obesity, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, um, some diverticulitis and colon cancer, and then other colon um, surgeries have been reported as well um, to, um, to have this bowel bypass syndrome. A lot is not known about this. Um, it is reported in the literature and there have been, there were some significant case studies um, and some uh, manuscripts. A lot of them are older. Um, back in the 80s, 90s, and early two, uh, 2000s. So the etiology as we know it is an overgrowth of bacteria in a blind loop where digested food doesn't pass. Um, so that makes sense that it was from um, a bowel surgery is the most common. Um, you can see here that E. coli is the most common bacteria that's found, but there can be others as well. I mean, what happens is bacterial overgrowth in this blind loop, and it releases bacterial antigens into the circulations, and those are called um, pepidoglycans. They bind with circulating antibodies in the blood, and it deposits those, those, those antibodies in the, that complex 
will deposit in the skin and joints. Typically, it is seen one to six years after bowel surgery, um, but it can be sooner and sometimes it can be um, later um, than that. Um, and it typically lasts, it typically lasts a lot longer than it did with my patients. It, that's one part that didn't necessarily fit with my patient, typically lasts two to four weeks. Um, and it does relapse every four to six weeks, which does fit uh, with, with the history that my patient had given me. So you have cutaneous and non-cutaneous symptoms. Um, cutaneous symptoms, small red papules, blisters, pustules um, on truck and upper arms, and it may, um, may resemble um, sweets, so a neutrophilic dermatosis. Um, it can resemble um, erythema nodosum or paniculitis. For my patient, it did seem he was describing, although it wasn't present, more of the enodosum um, presentation, but any of these can, it can print, present in any of these ways. Non-cutaneous um, symptoms, fever, um, not all the time, but some, muscle aches and pains, non-destructive polyarthritis, um, and, um, you know, tendons, you know, your tendons can actually hurt uh, with um, tendinosivitis as well. Um, so those are typical symptoms um, for this bowel bypass syndrome. And these are examples um, of some pictures. Again, these aren't from my patient, um, but um, in there are others, there's some other pictures um, in the literature where it almost looks um, ulcerative. Um, you know, there are some reports that it can be a little bit ulcerative um, um, looking as well. So bowel bypass syndrome without bowel bypass, without bowel surgery, is pretty rare. There's, there's some interesting case reports out there. Um, associated diagnoses that may go with this are diverticulitis, um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, none of and peptic ulcer disease or duodenal ulcer disease. And there was a case report um, about appendicitis as well um, that, that was associated with bowel bypass syndrome. Um, all of those are bowel diagnoses. So you would, um, are not necessarily surprised um, that some of those um, that impact um, the, these diseases that impact the bowel might, um, you know, be attributed to, to, one, to, to bowel bypass without bowel bypass. So this is a case report um, after laparoscopic ga um, gastric bypass surgery. Um, and the interesting thing here, um, interesting thing here that I just wanted to um, point out, they report that it could look like sweets, it could look like pustular vasculitis, um, leukoclastic um, vasculitis, rheumatoid neutrophilic dermatoses, General, generalized pustulosis or even pyoderma gangrenosum. So, you know, those, those ulcerative um, open sores, um, there have been case reports for each of these that were linked with the bowel bypass. The thing that connects them um, typically is the joint pain and the, and the arthritis pain and the muscle aches. So these are two case um, case studies of patients without bowel surgery and what was done to treat them. Um, the first case was uh, metronidazole and um, ciprofl cipro ciprofloxacin. Um, and after they were treated for two weeks and after, a after within one week, the symptoms recurred. So they started the metronidazole four times a day and they waited until she was clear um, before they stopped it. Um, the other patient, Kate, the second case was they treated with prednisone um, and metronidazole um, three times a day, and they slowly tapered the, um, the prednisone and continued the antibiotics for a month. Um, so that was treated um, successfully. Um, so that kind of gave me uh, some other um, ways on how we were going to treat this patient. So the thing to remember is they're inconsistent clinical features. Um, they're inconsistent histological features. And oftentimes they relapse after the treatment is withdrawn. So, 
and then again, it can recur after you think it's gone. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a, you know, interesting phenomenon that happens and you can actually understand why my patient was withdrawn. He was afraid to put himself out there is because when, after it went away, it was just a matter of time before it came back. Um, so this was something that was significantly impacting his life. So here's a, here's a case report um, of uh, a bowel associated dermatosis and arthritis syndrome or badass um, treated by Eustachinumab. Um, so, you know, interestingly enough, um, and it does make sense um, that because we know Eustachinumab is approved to treat bowel conditions um, and, you know, um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, but it does make sense that that Eustachinumab or other biologics um, might might treat um, this bowel bypass syndrome. Um, and it's important to investigate and treat any GI condition. And so that's um, was concerning to my patient because he didn't report any. He re recorded. He reported to me normal bowel bowel habits, um, no family history, um, nothing, no appendicitis, nothing um, that was associated with the gut at all. So here is an example of what we might see on histology. Um, we often will see the erythematous macules and papules that some can become vesicular pustular. And on histology, there is often papillary dermal edema and a dense perivascular neutrophilic infiltrate. And based on the kind of random and, and interesting ways that, that this bowel bypass syndrome can manifest cutaneously, um, we shouldn't be surprised that um, these that neutrophilic infiltrate um, is, is, is present. Um, it's interesting that primary vasculitis and um, fibrinoid um, necrosis, they're, they're typically absent. Um, so if you were able to get a biopsy, um, you know, I, it's probably not going to point to bowel bypass syndrome. Um, but if you were able to isolate the neutrophilic infiltrate, um, it might point you in the direction if you combine the clinical presentation as well. So how do, what do you do? What do you do when patients have this? Um, so patients with the history of bowel surgery, um, you need to make sure you're evaluating for um, changes that are secondary to malabsorption. You wanna make sure that you're looking at their um, creatine, their electrolyte imbalance, and look and see if um, their malabsorption might lead to abnormal liver function test. Um, if you're able to get a skin biopsy, you know, you do want to do that um, and look for those, those um, neutrophils as well. Um, so that's the first step. Treatment options for patients with bowel surgery is find that blind loop and you can revise it with, um, revise that um, bowel bypass um, surgery. Um, that's going to be the curative um, cure um, for the, for this condition. Some systemic corticosteroids might prevent some systemic relief while you're waiting on um, the antibiotics or a biologic if you choose to go that way um, to, to work. Um, Minocycline, um, erythromycin, clindamycin, um, you know, Bactrim, um, and metronidazole have all been shown to, to show some benefits. The problem is, is how do you know, how do you know when to stop it? Um, some of the case studies, you know, that, that I reviewed and, and, and shared with you show that often when you stop it, it's back within one to two weeks. Um, the rash can come back pretty quickly. So, um, you know, it, it's kind of a trial and error with, with this um, condition. Um, but these are the antibiotics that have been shown. So let's go back to our patient. Um, you know, I, I really felt like that it was considered con consistent with bowel associated um, dermatosis arthritis syndrome. Um, you know, the 24 year old patient really liked that um, he had a badass um, diagnosis. So, um, but I did talk to him and referred to him, uh, referred him to GI. 
um, for a, 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 an upper and a lower evaluation to make sure that he didn't have the early signs of any um, bowel disease or gut, gut disease. Um, I decided to start doxycycline 50 milligrams twice a day at the low, you know, at a, at a relatively low anti-inflammatory type dose, similar to what we would do with, say, rosacea. Um, and I told him that he could continue to take the antihistamines if he felt like that he needed it. And I wanted him to keep a symptom diary and a calendar of when he had the outbreak, what he had done before, you know, if he could remember any bowel habits or bowel issues that he had, you know, a couple of days before this, you know, particular flare. Um, so I wanted to see him back in three months. Um, but I told him, please call me. You know, we can up the dose. We can change the antibiotic. Um, I can get you on some corticosteroids, you know. So, I mean, I told him to give us a call. But at, at, at the three-month follow-up, um, he came in ecstatic. He had only, he reported one event since his last visit. They decreased in intensity. Um, he felt like he was recovering completely within 12 to 24 hours. Um, so decreased joints, um, joint pain and arthritis. But as not, no surprise, a 24 year old is not going to want to go have a colonoscopy and an upper GI. So, um, he did not go to the GI appointment. And I, I spent some a, a pretty good amount of time uh, that visit, again, talking to him. We want to catch things early. There's, there's systemic medications we can put you on if you're diagnosed with, you know, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis um, that might better treat this. Um, so, you know, I, I did encourage him to go to GI. Also encouraged him to really talk to his parents, grandparents, about any GI history um, in the in the recent past and in their family history um, to see if if he could maybe ascertain any family history or family risk factors that that he might not know about. Um, so we did have a long conversation about that. So follow up visit two was six months later. He continued to see improvement. Um, he reported zero flares since his last visit. Um, and he said that he, he was not going to not take his antibiotic. Um, he, was, he said he was very compliant with that. And again, guess what? He hadn't seen his GI yet. Um, and again, spent some time talking to, talking to him about the importance of following up with the GI. He was excited. He started dating again, and he actually had had a promotion at work um, because he wasn't having those missed days. So he was loving life at this point, um, you know, really happy with um, with the treatment and the, the, the what he thought was the resolution or the successful treatment of this issue. So follow up three was year, one year after after I had I saw him initially. Um, he reported a total of five flares in 12 months, which was much better than um, he was reporting, but he said they only lasted about 15 minutes. Um, mild itching, minimal to no rash, and minimal joint pain. He was able to function immediately after the flare. Um, he did go to GI. Um, and he did get an upper um, upper GI and a lower um, and a colonoscopy. Um, he had been taking doxycycline um, daily instead of twice a day, um, and he felt like that he didn't see significant um, when he decreased that dose. He said, "I didn't see any um, significant um, worsening." I mean, he's really pleased with the results. Um, I haven't seen him since. Since um, this was this was relatively recently. Um, so we decided to keep him on the 50 milligrams daily. Um, I did tell him, and, and he has enough medication, that if, if he started having more significant flares, that he could go back to twice daily if he needed to. So that is my Stranger Things um, case study. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you um, might 
if you see something like that come in your clinic, that you might, something might flag you like my friend's diagnosis of colorectal cancer did um, to kind of search for a, a really stranger things diagnosis. So um, thank you for um, your attention and um, look forward to seeing you at the conference. Have a great night.